In the 1950s, as the white working class was disappearing into the classless middle, African Americans were still only visible as servants or entertainers. In order to gain broader access to television, blacks and other marginalized groups would have to learn to play by TV's rules, namely to have faith in the American dream. While this logic has served television's commercial imperatives, it has also reduced struggles for economic justice and social equality to a simple matter of inclusion. In the post-civil rights era, the arrival of African Americans onto prime time suggests that there is no need for the redistribution of wealth and power, because on TV there is plenty of room for everyone. In good times, all the characters knew that they were being exploited. They were always struggling against the man. No, man, I tell you the way it is. I got a family. They need food on the table and clothes on their back, and I got to pay rent. Now, I need that job. Government rules can't be broken. Unless you're running the government. <laughs> but they always had these dreams, that classic American dreams, that if they work hard, that they'll finally get out of the projects and they'll succeed. Baby, without money, people like us ain't got no chance at all. But it ain't always gonna be that way, James. And of course, that doesn't happen to the very end of the program, the last episode, which is sort of like Gilligan's Island, where they get off the island and they, they escape the, the projects. And many of the ghetto sitcoms that came during and after the run of Good Times really pastoralize ghetto life at a time period when there were so many African Americans living in poverty in cities. The, the notion of what it's like on what's happening, where everything was pretty happy, pretty safe. You could say, well, look, the ghettos aren't that bad. The 1970s was a period of, of anti-affirmative action, of heightened joblessness among African Americans, and a backlash against black people and people of color generally. The other storyline running through black sitcoms at the same time deal with this idea of moving on up. You know, but these shows don't deal with economic hardships at all. I think the best known example is the Jeffersons, you know, with the self-made man, George Jefferson. To a deluxe apartment in the sky. George is a Horatio Alger story. Um, he has pulled himself up by his bootstraps. His dry cleaning business has enabled him to move away from Archie Bunker on Hauser Street and to the east side. You know, he is gaining access and all the trappings that go along with um, moving on up. George, dear, I'm glad for your success too, but let's not forget, you are still the grandson of a sharecropper and I'm the daughter of a janitor. We are just plain folks. He proves that black people are successful, so therefore the civil rights movement's over. He proves that there's no need for affirmative action, you know, because he's a self-made man. He proves that there's no need for welfare because these people can make it on their own. Your family started at zero and look what you've got now. A son going to college, a lovely wife, successful business and a beautiful apartment. And you did it all by yourself. <laughs> Another example of this moving on up suggested that what black youth need are white people to come in and step in with superior parenting skills and resources to basically bring them out of the ghetto. So Different Strokes is a classic example. Aha! You're here. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> you're talking to us? Of course. How about that, Willis? Downtown two minutes and already we're gentlemen. By the time you get to, to Cosby, moving on up takes an even different dimension. Because I would argue that Cosby isn't about moving on up. They're already there. It's a show in which you have the quote-unquote normal family, a very strong committed father figure who's a good father, who has all the right answers, who has all the elements of the white fathers of um, shows like Different Strokes. You have a mother who's a working mother, you know, an attorney, a doctor and attorney together, and they're comical, but they're not buffoons. And I think that one of the attractions of The Cosby Show, to black viewers at least, was that, oh, here's normal life. Here's something that's not a cartoon character. 
at the same time, it has basically erased, for the most part, the kinds of struggles and realities that the black poor and working class are dealing with at that very moment. The Huxtables represented the kind of black people that you can be friends with. They're safe in the age of crack, in this age of ghetto violence, it normalizes black people in some ways. But it also, again, you know, in some ways, did what the Jeffersons did. It convinced viewers that, look, if you work really hard, you know, you don't need help from the state. It continues to do the general work of affirming the openness of a kind of middle class society and the arrival of racial difference into that. And it continues to do the particular work of saying to African Americans, see your images here. And besides, you know, the networks know how to do that well. They know how to make middle class, upper class shows about urban life and affluence. They, they do it well, they've done it well for 30 years. There have been some black working class characters. I mean, for example, you got the Fresh Prince. This character played by Will Smith is having some trouble in the ghetto. And so he's shipped off to live with his rich relatives in Bel Air, you know, and leaves his single mom you know, behind in the hood. The show recycles the old storyline of taking poor black youth out of the ghetto. You know. But in this post-Cosby world, you know, the rescuers now are the black families that have made it. You know, and there are other shows like Rock um, that have taken up some of the complexities of race and class politics. But the networks have done such a crappy job of promoting these shows and building audiences for them that you know, they don't last long.